Thank you, Bob, and thank you, everyone, for coming. So um, climate change is an issue that probably a lot of you have experienced in a variety of different ways. How many people here have actually had a part of a class or even several classes on climate change at school? A few people. OK. How many people have seen Al Gore's movie? OK. And how many of you have learned about climate change through other things, through books or newspapers? Or, right. So, so there's actually a lot of information out there. Um, what I'm going to tell you about today first is about the climate system. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about a perspective that I have as a geologist. So I'm actually a geologist. I actually study the Earth through all different time scales, over <laughs> billions of years, over millions of years, and over thousands of years, um, and also looking into the future. So what I first want to do is talk about the way I see the climate system, which is probably a little bit different than what you hear about in newspapers or in books. And then second, I want to talk about something that the Al Gore movie didn't do very much, which is talk about, OK, what do we do about it? What are we actually going to do about this problem? Because it is a very serious problem. Now, how many people here know what this curve is? Or have seen this curve before? OK. This is the life work of one man. His name was Dave Keeling, Charles David Keeling, and everybody called him Dave. And in 1957, he started measuring atmospheric CO2 from Mauna Loa, Hawaii. Why do you think he chose Mauna Loa, Hawaii? Any ideas? Yeah. What did you think? Uh huh. But why would that matter for atmospheric CO2? Right. The big thing he was worried about was pollution. When we drive cars, we burn oil, we burn gasoline, and it turns into CO2. And there's all sorts of other effects from industrial activities. So he wanted to get far away from that. And the winds in Hawaii, up high on a mountain, you're getting a lot of fresh air. And so therefore, it was a nice, safe place to go. And sure enough, what he did is he saw a seasonal cycle. He saw it going up and down. Now, the reason it's going up and down really is just because we have seasons. Hawaii's in the northern hemisphere. And so in the spring and summertime, trees are taking up carbon. They're photosynthesizing and soaking up CO2 from the atmosphere. And atmospheric CO2 drops. And then in the fall and winter, when there's winter time in the northern hemisphere, the soils produce a lot of CO2. The plants don't take up much. And so as a result, there's a lot of CO2 going back to the atmosphere. And it goes up again. And he saw this going up and down. But instead of stopping, he actually kept going. And most scientists, after a few years, would have said, OK, we've done this for a few years. Time to do something else. But Dave Keeling was an unusual guy. He was incredibly focused. And he spent his entire life producing this data set. I don't know if you can see. There's one little gap here. Right in here? That's when he actually ran out of funding. The government stopped paying him to do it. And he had to shut it down for a little while. But they, they kept him going. And the rest is history. What he's shown is that the CO2, when he died in 2005, CO2 was about 380 parts per million. When he started, it was 315 parts per million. Now, that's a pretty big change. And it turns out we know exactly why it changed. It changed because we're burning a lot of coal and oil and natural gas. And in fact, luckily for us, most of that CO2 is actually going to the air. But 40% is actually being soaked up by the oceans and soaked up by plants. And so in fact, the natural world is kind of doing us a favor. It's actually giving us a little bit of a safety margin. It's buffering it. Only 60% of what we burn ends up in the air. But the, that CO2 is causing it to go up and up and up. Now the problem with this is you can't really tell why anyone should care about this. So it goes from 315 to 380. How big a deal is that? Now, as a geologist, I see this graph a little bit differently. And let me try to show you how I see it. Ginger, could we go to the next slide? Oh, back one. Through, back two. Back two, please. You're messing it up, please. There, one more. Thank you. This is the record of CO2 in the atmosphere now over a very different time scale. This is 700,000 years ago. OK? This is from an ice core called Epica. And the lighter blue is from an ice core called Vostok. They're both in, towards the middle of Antarctica. And these records scientists generated from CO2 from bubbles in the ice core. And 
This is the level here before the Industrial Revolution. If we had measured it in Mauna Loa 300 years ago, that's the level it would have been, about 280 parts per million. Back here, 20,000 years ago, this is the last glacial maximum, what some people call the last ice age. Well, the truth is we're actually in an ice age today, but we won't tell. We'll, we'll talk about that in a minute. This is 20,000 years ago. This is a very different world. CO2 was about 180 parts per million. The world was very cold. It was about five degrees colder. I'll show you that in a second. Where I live in Boston, we were under about a mile of ice. So it was a very different world. In fact, it was so different that sea level was about 130 meters lower because there was so much water turned into snow that big ice sheets built up on continents that the sea level actually dropped 130 meters or almost 400 feet. Okay, very different world. Now, in the last 200 years, this is what's happened. That's 2007. Okay, so that's where we are today at 200, about 380 parts per million. And in the next 40 years to 60 years, depending on exactly what we do, this is what's going to happen. Ginger? Yes. Perfect. So that's, that's where we're going to be sometime around the middle of the century. Now, the question is whether we go, stay there or whether we literally go up through the roof. That's about 500 parts per million. The question is, do we go all the way to 1,000 parts per million by the end of the century? Now, this, as a geologist, is what has me concerned. This is an experiment we're doing on the planet. And it turns out that although we can't we haven't yet found ice cores that go back further than about 650,000 years. Indirectly, we can reconstruct the levels of CO2 in the atmosphere. And we estimate that it hasn't been much higher than today's levels, probably for like 30 million years, maybe even 40 million years. What this means is that the level of CO2 in the atmosphere that we're all experiencing today is higher than any human being who has ever lived on the planet. In fact, higher than any higher ape. In fact, you have to go back 30 or 40 million years long before the human species and before higher apes even existed before you can actually find CO2 levels like the one that we're going to experience in the next 50 years. So this is an experiment on the planet that hasn't been done for 50, or for say 30 or 40 million years. Nobody knows exactly what's going to happen. There's no scientist that understands the Earth so well to predict exactly what's going to happen. And that's my perspective as a geologist. Now, we know CO2 causes warming. And it turns out you can look for it, you know this very easily. Would you go to the next slide, Ginger? This is Earth and Venus. Venus is our neighboring planet toward the sun. It's the first star you see in the sky towards the sun when the sun sets. It's always towards the sun because it sits towards the sun. And Venus is about the same size as the Earth. It's a little closer to the sun, which means that it should be a little bit warmer. Although it turns out that, in fact, it's so much brighter on the surface that it actually reflects a lot of that sunlight back to space. And so if it had the same atmosphere as the Earth, it would be substantially colder than the Earth. The Earth has a nice atmosphere that helps keep it warm. Venus has a really thick atmosphere. It's about 100 times thicker than the Earth's. And it's almost entirely made up of CO2. And so the main reason Venus is hot, and by the way, it's really hot. It's about 460 degrees Celsius. It means that field work on Venus for astronauts is really difficult. <laughs> um, so that's why we're going to Mars, because minus 50 degrees is much easier than plus 460 degrees. Um, so it turns out the main reason Venus is hot is not because it's closer to the sun, but in fact, because it has a 100 times thicker atmosphere composed of almost entirely of CO2. Now, if we were just looking at the Earth, and if it had a dry atmosphere like Venus, if it didn't have water, then it would be really easy to predict what the additional CO2 would be. We understand the greenhouse effect really, really well. In fact, scientists have been talking about it for 100 years. So the effect of CO2 by itself is pretty easy. The problem and the reason the Earth become, the, the weather becomes so complicated is because of all this blue stuff and white stuff. It's water. Water is a very interesting substance covering the Earth. It 
absorbs sunlight. It's very dark, and so it absorbs sunlight. It evaporates, which cools the surface, and forms water vapor. And it turns out that water vapor is an even more powerful greenhouse gas than CO2. At the same time, it also forms clouds. And the clouds can actually be very white and therefore reflect light back to space. And so that means that water on the Earth actually makes understanding the climate of the Earth really complicated. Most of the uncertainty about the Earth's climate actually comes down to problems with understanding water. So it's not just the CO2 we're adding. It's the effect that when we add CO2, more water evaporates. And that amplifies the CO2 effect. And exactly how much that amplifies is the major source of uncertainty in understanding the climate. Let's skip a couple ahead. One more. OK. Geologically speaking, the last time that we think CO2 was about as high as we're going to see in this next century was a time called the Eocene. This was about 55 to 36 million years ago. And it was a very different world. Can you go to the, let's click it again. So it was extremely warm in the Eocene. There were palm trees in Wyoming. Now, I don't know how many of you have been up to Wyoming in the wintertime. It's pretty cold in the wintertime. Palm trees can't grow where it goes below freezing. And lo and behold, there were palm trees flourishing there. Crocodiles lived all the way up at Ellesmere Island, well above the Arctic Circle. Antarctica was a pine forest. Deep ocean temperature was about 12 degrees Celsius. Today, it's about 2 degrees Celsius. And sea level was at least 100 meters higher because there was no ice anywhere. No ice on Antarctica, no ice on Greenland. It was a warm, ice-free world. Very, very different world. This is an interesting natural analog for the future. The problem is this was a world, you know, the animals lived in the Eocene very happily. And if we were back there, we would have probably been very happy too. Palm trees in Wyoming sounds pretty nice, doesn't it? The problem is not climate change. It's how fast it changes. And the reason is that we become adapted to our current climate. We build houses. We build farms. We adapt to the climate we live in. And the, more, more importantly, the animals and plants adapt to the climate they live in. Now, the climate can change slowly. And those plants and animals and people can adapt. But if it changes too quickly, it's very hard to adapt. Yes? Wouldn't high concentrations of carbon dioxide be beneficial toward the plants and uh, bad for animals? Um, Repeat the question. The question was, was, wouldn't higher carbon dioxide be bad, good for plants and bad for animals? <laughs> In fact, no. Probably it would be good for some plants and bad for other plants, and plants. good for some animals and bad for other animals. And it turns out. That the CO2 levels we're talking about aren't toxic to animals. And some plants can grow a little faster under CO, higher CO2 conditions. Some grow a little slower. It turns out that, that what evolution is about is actually competition between different species. And the species that lived in the Eocene were adapted to that climate and that level of CO2. Just like the plants today are adapted to our climate and our level of CO2. And when we see a change, we can see a sort of struggle to adapt in the natural world. That's what's going on today. Let's click again, Ginger. So there's a little secret about this that worries me about this climate when we study this. Can you click it again? Oh, well, OK. Let, let's move on. This is, this, I, I, let's move on because um, I want to I get to really open it up to your questions. This is the last ice age. This is the last glacial maximum um, 18,000 years ago. This is what the world northern hemisphere looked like. So this is the ice sheet covering most of North America. New Mexico was still ice free, but you can see a good part of, U of the US was covered. The ice came down to about New York City. Long Island was the glacial terminal moraine. This is what the northern hemisphere looks like today. And when I said you we're still in an ice age, there's Greenland. There's an ice sheet on Greenland and sea ice in the Arctic. We still have ice today. In the Eocene, there was no ice at all. Now, one of the problems is that climate scientists like me, we talk about global average temperature. And that's, you always hear, well, scientists think the temperature is going to rise by 3 degrees. You say, boy, 3 degrees. Temperature changed by about 20 degrees this afternoon. You know, what, who cares about 3 degrees? Well, that's the problem, is we don't think very intuitively about global average temperature. We think about local temperature, which varies a lot, especially in the desert. 
the difference between the last ice age when sea level was 130 meters lower and today is about five degrees Celsius. And what we're talking about doing this next century, we could raise Earth's temperature another five degrees in the opposite direction. That's the, again, the scale of the experiment that we're talking about doing. And the question is, how quickly will things change? Ginger, let's move on. Now, there's lots of evidence that what's going on and what we're observing around the world today is related to human activities. But the best piece of evidence is actually from glaciers, not at the poles, but actually at, near the equator. Most people don't think about the fact that there's ice at the equator. But there is in the very tall mountains. In the Andes, in New Guinea, there's a big glacier. In Kilimanjaro, there's the snows of Kilimanjaro, and there's glaciers up there. And there's a guy named Lonnie Thompson, who's a professor at Ohio State University. Lonnie's kind of a hero of mine. He spent most of his life going climbing these tall mountains with six tons of solar-powered drilling equipment. You know, if you met him, he looks like this mild guy. He kind of looks like, you know, very, very calm, not very professorial. He's, he's a very gentle, diminutive guy. And turns out he's really Indiana Jones. <laughs> Literally, he's, he's a modern Indiana Jones. He has climbed mountains all over the world with six tons of solar drilling pad equipment. And when you, go up this, when you go up this high, you can't bring helicopters. They don't work at this altitude. This is 22,000 feet in the Andes, Halkaya, Peru. Um, so you have to carry all this stuff mostly by hand, by, on your own two feet. So you have teams of people carrying up. And then mountain climbers go up, summit, and then they come back down the, the next, after a few hours. He stays up there for two or three months at a time. This man has spent three years of his life above 18,000 feet. So there are sort of neurologists lined up to study his brain someday when he dies. <laughs> um, but he's going strong. And what he has documented is that tropical glaciers all over the world are melting. And the reason this is significant to a climate scientist is that the equator is very, very stable. You know, some people say, well, maybe the warming we've been seeing in global temperatures recently in the last 100 years it's just part of a natural cycle. You know, climate goes up and down. We saw the ice ages come and go. Maybe this is just part of those natural cycles. And the answer is no, it's not. And we can prove it. We have very good records for the last several thousand years. And Lonnie Thompson can show that the melting he sees in tropical glaciers hasn't happened for thousands of years. And it's not just in Peru. And I'll show you the next picture. This is a picture he took in 78. This is what the same glacier looks like uh, in 2002. It's much, much further back today. It's accelerating. Um, uh, Kilimanjaro is a very famous site. Will you go to the next one? This is Kilimanjaro from 1912, 1970, 2000. It's harder to see in this sort of profile. A better view is, is in 2000, he drilled some ice cores up there, and he took an aerial photograph of the top of the mountain. And that's this picture from Febru early February 2000. He thought the ice he knew the ice was melting. He thought it would melt. He thought it would be gone within maybe 30 years. He went back and did another aerial survey six years later. And I was there just a few weeks after he got back to visit him in Ohio. And he gave me this picture. This is 2006. He now thinks it's going to be gone in a decade. So if any of you want to see the famous snows of Kilimanjaro, Hemingway's great short story, this is, you better hurry, because it's going to be gone within a decade. Um, and this is not just true in Africa, it's true in Africa, it's true in Peru, it's true in Tibet, it's true in New Guinea. All over the world, tropical glaciers are melting. And this is a part of the Earth's climate system that's very stable. Very little weather. So when you see this change at the equator, it has to be global. There's no other explanation. And we know this hasn't happened for thousands of years, coincident with this very large rise in the greenhouse gas level of the atmosphere. Next slide, Ginger. So, we're performing an experiment at a planetary scale that hasn't been done for millions of years. No one knows exactly what's going to happen. Now, climate scientists are working very hard to make predictions. We're doing the best we can. But we're not perfect. There will be surprises. Um, would you click again? And uh, once more. So some of the things that people have talked about are droughts in some places, heat waves, floods, storms, sea level rise, mountain snow melt. By the way, some of these things are going to be good. There's some places that are dry that are going to get wetter. There's some places that are wetter that are going to get drier. 
Some of these things are going to be good. Some of these things are going to be bad. The question is, how are we going to adapt to them? One of the ones that worries me the most is this one right here. And I think you guys are, must be sensitive to this. You realize that mountains are actually natural reservoirs. That snow, snow melt, snow is like a natural reservoir. In California, the Sierra Nevada stores so much water for California agriculture that then melts over the course of the whole summer. And what's beginning to happen is that melt is coming earlier and earlier. There's flooding in the Sacramento Valley now that like we haven't seen for a long time. And what's, what people are worried about is that 50 years from now, it'll be mostly rain and not snow. And there aren't enough reservoirs in California to store the water. So mountains are sort of our natural reservoirs. And in the US is the least of the concern. Asia is a huge problem. So if this actually, if these glaciers and the snow melts earlier in Asia, you have China and India that have huge populations dependent on that natural snow melt for the water to live on. And so this is a big problem. Next, please. So there will be winners and losers. Now, let's talk about some of the impacts that you might have heard about. Um, one of the things that people talk about, when I go to London and I get in a taxi cab, they always tell me that they're going to that the ocean circulation is going to change and they're going to enter an ice age because of global warming. Um, some of you have probably heard about this, right? So, so it turns out that there is something called the conveyor belt. This is a cartoon of it. But there is a lot of water, that warm water, that comes north in the Atlantic and sinks in the North Atlantic and forms bottom water. It's a huge amount of water. It's about 20 times larger than, the, than all the rivers in the world put together. Um, how many of you have seen this movie? Next slide. How many of you have seen The Day After Tomorrow? Yeah, so, so when this movie opened, actually, Al Gore and Al Franken and I were in New York to sort of give a talk about this movie. Um, it's total science fiction. It's total garbage. It's not going to happen. But it was a lot of fun to watch. Al Franken stole my joke. He said it was the sort of movie that people like me were, were too embarrassed to, to, to actually tell anybody that we had watched. So we would watch in our hotel room, and then the, the, the title, we'd be afraid to put the title on the bill, so they would just black it out. Um, so in this movie, this ocean conveyor belt shuts down, and three days later, the whole northern hemisphere freezes. Four billion people die. But the kids sa get saved. Jake Gyllenhaal is OK. Um, so it has a happy ending. But New York is sort of destroyed. Um, this movie is really completely wrong. Um, let me show you why. Uh, and so I, there are some myths I want to bust here. Take, so, so it turns out that there is this circulation in the North Atlantic. It's very important. Most of it's actually driven by the winds. So the winds blow east to west in the tropics and west to east. Here, this is called the jet stream. This is called the trade winds. Could you click again, Ginger? So the primary reason, oh, can you go back one? Primary reason that, the, that, the, that, the, that Europe is warm relative to the east coast of North America is that essentially they're on the downstream end of the winds blowing over the warm ocean. And what oceans do is they soak up heat in the summer and then release it in the winter. And they keep the climate mild. As a result, if you compl compare Paris and Madrid and, and London to Seattle and Vancouver, you'll understand why it's a lot warmer than, say, Boston or New York. On the other hand, it turns out that Europe is still warmer than Seattle and Vancouver. And the reason actually has to do with the Rocky Mountains. Click again, please. Um, what happens is the winds are approaching the North, North America, and they hit the Rockies, and they have to go up. And as they go up, it turns out that the Coriolis force, because the Earth is rotating, actually makes them move northward. And so they actually move north like this. And the wind then comes back down. And in Boston, we get these cold winds from the Canadian Arctic. It's very cold in the wintertime. Then the winds come here, pick up nice warm water in the subtropical Atlantic, and bring it north into, into England. And so that's why English winters are so mild. And then the Gulf Stream contributes to that as well. But the point is, click once more, please, that, that uh, if the conveyor belt did shut down, northern Europe might cool a bit. More likely, it would just not warm as much. But we're not going to enter an ice age. That's not something you have to worry about. Here are some things you should worry about. Next. This is a picture of Hurricane Katrina. It's a beautiful storm if you study 
hurricanes. It's a Category 5 storm bearing down on New Orleans. The myth is that it hit New Orleans. It missed New Orleans. And we're very lucky. It hit Mississippi. It didn't hit New Orleans. The last minute, it took a turn and hit Mississippi. There were 400,000 people living in the New Orleans area when it hit. And the city flooded, but it flooded only over a couple of days. So most people had a time to move to higher ground. If this storm had hit New Orleans, it would have flooded in about a minute. And we could have had 100,000 people die. So we were very lucky. Next. Now, just before the storm hit, two weeks before the storm hit, Carrie Emanuel, my colleague who's a professor at MIT, published this paper. And this was a scientific paper in the journal Nature. And what it showed was two things, the, the correlation of what he called PDI. And what that is is called power dissipation index. What it is is it's the power produced by hurricanes. It's essentially not just the wind speed, but how large the storms are in radius and how long they last and how many there are. So, so it calculates all of those things and calculates that. And he plotted it against SST, which is sea surface temperature in the subtropical Atlantic. Now, the data before 1970 are bad because we didn't have satellites. And so essentially, you can sort of ignore the data before 1970. The important part is this record. And what you see is that they're very well correlated. Turns out that wasn't a surprise. Hurricane scientists knew that hurricanes are fueled by warm surface water. And so they expected a correlation there. What was surprising was that the increase that they've seen is twice as large as what the best theories predicted. So part of the point, you could click again, please. Uh, one more. The change was twice as large as predicted by theory. What, what I'm trying to say by that is just that we're doing this experiment on the planet. Sometimes the result may be that the climate change is going to be less than we expect. But it's also possible that that uncertainty cuts the wrong way, and things may be worse than we expect. And in this case, it looks like hurricanes are more sensitive than we had previously anticipated. Next, please. OK. Here's what I really worry about. And this has the potential to dramatically change the surface of the Earth. Now, luckily, here in Santa Fe at 7,000 feet, we're pretty safe from sea level change. But as the US, we're not so safe. This is Greenland from 1992. The orange is where it was melting. And the red in 2002. And this seems to be accelerating. We are seeing dramatic changes in Greenland, the likes of which glaciologists have never imagined seeing. And the problem is glaciologists will not and cannot predict how fast Greenland is melting. We can measure it today. It's melting very slowly. The sea level rise is something like a half a millimeter a year. Next slide, please. Um, but, but the amount of water stored in these ice sheets is huge. Greenland is about seven meters of sea level equivalent. That means if Greenland melted completely, sea level would rise seven meters. West Antarctica, the small part of Antarctica, is about six meters of sea level equivalent. We don't even want to talk about the eastern part of Antarctica because that's about 50 meters of sea level equivalent. Now, next slide. Next. The, the real question is, how long is it going to take to melt these? They're melting today. The actual rate of melting today is about a half a millimeter a year. It's going up very slowly. So the question is, how will that accelerate? We see it accelerating, but we don't know how long it will take to melt. Maybe if it's 1,000 years, it'll be so slow that we can adapt to it. But what if it's 200 years? That's a bit of a problem. And let me try to give you a scale of what this means. Next slide, please. This is a picture of Florida and the Gulf Coast of the US. I don't know how well you guys see the geography. Do you know Lake Pontchartrain? That's, that's that sort of big area right there. That's, and New Orleans is right on Lake Pontchartrain. Now watch Lake Pontchartrain and watch South Florida. This is what happens if half of Greenland melts. Next slide. It's a big deal. Let's go back. Watch this area right here. Go back one. There you go. There are a lot of people that live here. Now, again, I'm not saying this is going to happen in 100 years, maybe not even in 200 years, but it might. No one can actually say whether it will or not right now. 
We can monitor Greenland, we can watch it very carefully, and we're trying to improve our understanding of these glaciers as best we can, but we don't know. Again, we're doing an experiment, it's an uncontrolled experiment, and we don't know exactly how this is going to work out. Next slide, please, one after that. So it turns out that a variety of countries are taking a lot of steps to adapt to climate change. And adaptation doesn't just mean packing your bags and moving, it actually means some big engineering things. It actually is expensive. And so this is in London. This is called the Thames Barrier. It was very expensive. It cost something like, it cost, I think, 10 billion pounds to build. They built it to protect the city of London. And the Thames runs right through London, and it's a tidal river, and it floods. And they were worried about the destruction done by the flooding of the Thames. And so they built this to control the Thames against periodic flooding from sea level rise. And they expected to use it one or two times a decade, and now they're using it a few times a year. So it's increasing its severity. So it's becoming very useful. Next slide. This is the Netherlands. The Netherlands has a big engineering problem because the Netherlands, a lot of the Netherlands is below sea level, that dark orange part is below sea level. Where they actually build these immense barriers to protect these areas against the ocean. You've all heard about this sort of when you were kids. Next. So this is what they do in the Netherlands. They build large dikes that protect the low-lying areas against the rising sea level. Next slide. This is what we do in New Orleans. <laughs> so it's, you know, we have to think a little bit about, about what, the way we deal with these sorts of situations. Next, please. So the real question is, next, next one. If Greenland or West Antarctica started to slide into the ocean, do we think we could actually stop it? That's something that I've actually been worrying about a lot recently. And it's not just a hypothetical question. It's something that we actually have to start planning for. And the answer may be, the answer is probably maybe but it requires some Herculean things that we might not be happy with. Next. So there's a problem here. The climate system has a lot of inertia. What that means is that the carbon dioxide we put in the air stays there a long time, and once glaciers start to melt, it's hard to just freeze them up again. And so, and also it turns out that the big coal plants we built, they last a long time as well. So my friend John Holdren likes to say, we're not driving a sports car. Next, click on the next one. Or next one, we're actually driving a super tanker. When you drive a super tanker, it's very hard to slow down and it's hard to steer. So if you see a shoal up ahead and you're worried about running aground, you don't argue about whether it's a shoal, you actually are a little bit careful. That's essentially what we're talking about here. We have to anticipate things because by the time we see a catastrophe, it may be too late to fix it. That's the reason that we, this is a very difficult problem to solve. Next, please. So, so what's the solution? How do we keep CO2 below a dangerous level? The problem is nobody knows what, a, what level is dangerous. I mean, the one that's truly safe would be the pre-industrial level of 280 parts per million, but we're already at 380 parts per million. So we have a bunch of problems, and oh, we need a plan. Next, please. So next, keep clicking. So, so it turns out that, that to solve the CO2 problem, you have to deal with fossil fuel. And you can keep clicking a couple, a couple more times. OK, twice more. So, so it turns out that when you start talking about energy and climate and fossil fuels, now you're not just talking about climate and environment. You're talking about national security. Everybody, anybody heard of what's going on in Iraq? Well, it probably has something to do with oil. Not completely, but something to do with it. Um, and it has big effects on our economy. Our economy is dependent on cheap energy. And we will hurt our economy tremendously if we just make stupid energy decisions. So you can't just fix this problem by itself. You have to actually worry about all of these things put together. And it's a really difficult problem. Next. Um, let me give you a scale of what we're talking about. And this is a little bit more quantitative, but let me, let me show you this. Click about four or five times. Keep going. Actually, it could be 10 times. I'll tell you when to stop. OK, keep going. Two more. Oh, no, back one. OK, so this is a projection of what the world might do in its energy use. This is a graph of world energy use here in a unit called exajoules. 
which is a lot of joules. And this is the year 2000 to 2100. Currently, we're about right here. And this is how much, where we get our energy from. Natural gas, petroleum, coal, nuclear, and renewables, mostly hydro. And this shows a growth in the future, oil and gas growing slowly because they're actually limited in their abundance, coal growing a lot faster because we have so much of it, and renewables and nuclear growing pretty fast too. Um, if that happens, CO2 in the atmosphere will be 1,000 parts per million. At 1,000 parts per million, I think most scientists believe that Greenland really is gone. That's a problem, and that's probably unacceptable. So how do you fix it? Well, keeping it to 550, 550 is an arbitrary number that scientists have come up with as a reasonable target. It may still bring dramatic climate change, but we think at least it might be better than going much beyond it. Next. Requires only that much, which means you have to cut out the big red part of this graph. All that future coal use, we have to somehow figure out an alternative for. And there's really only three choices. Next, please. There's three ways to reduce CO2 emissions. One is efficiency in concert or conservation. That means using less energy or using energy smarter. It doesn't necessarily mean depriving ourselves of a good way of life. It means just using better technology and being smarter and not wasting so much. Yeah. Uh, number two, it says non-fossil fuel energy. Uh, Well, uh, non-fossil fuel energy means renewables and nuclear, and biomass, which wood counts as biomass, it does count as renewables. Essentially, a tree takes up CO2 when it grows, and then by burning, you're taking that energy and using it, and the CO2 gets put back in the atmosphere. The net result is no change in the CO2. So, so, so the reason we don't count that as fossil fuel is because it hasn't been stored for millions of years. Um, so, so number two is non-fossil energy. This means wind and solar and biomass and nuclear. Um, and then the third is carbon capture and storage. What this means is burning fossil fuel, but grabbing the CO2 out of the smokestack and then pumping it underground somewhere. Now, it turns out all of these are going to be required. And what we're working on now, scientists all over the world are working on how this is actually going to take place. The exciting thing is that there's a revolution going on right now in energy. There's so much interest in these new forms of energy that we actually have a chance to solve this problem. I'm actually very optimistic that we're going to do this. And the reason is that all of these changes are probably not going to cost that much. They're going to cost a lot of money. They're going to cost, I don't know, for the US, maybe $100 billion a year. But you know what? We spend $100 billion on lots of different things. It turns out that's 1% of our economy. So we can actually afford this. It's not going to be cheap, but it's not going to be ridiculously expensive either. And so what I've been seeing recently over the last weeks and months is huge interest in businesses and actually trying to think of ways of actually making money solving this problem. And that's actually a good sign, because usually government will follow once businesses get interested. So the question is, how do you guys fit in? Where does this all go for you? Ultimately, it's your generation that's going to be handed this problem and asked to deal with it. The longer we wait, the longer we put this off and leave it to you guys to solve it, the more difficult it will be to solve. The earlier we work on it, the easier it will be to solve. But here's the problem. It's not just us. Next slide. You can skip through some of these. These are different sources of energy that we don't, we don't need to talk about. Keep, skip through all of this stuff. There. So this is CO2 emissions per capita. That is, per person around the world. And what you can see is that we are the red countries in Australia. That means we use the most, we produce the most CO2 per person. Saudi Arabia produces a lot too. And that's because oil production is very CO2 intensive. But the countries that are very light pink, you see China. China is about to pass the US in total CO2 production. 
And even though per person they use a tiny fraction of what we use, they're growing really fast. And they have over a billion people. India also is growing fast and is likely sometime this century to pass us as well. So the problem is not just the countries that use a lot per person, it's the countries that have a lot of people as well that are getting richer. And it's very difficult to tell poor countries that they can't get richer because of climate change. So the problem is not just solving our own problem, but it's actually helping the Chinese and the Indians and a lot of other countries figure out how they can actually have economic prosperity that they want. And frankly, it's hard to tell them that they don't deserve it. But without, with new technology that doesn't actually mess up the atmosphere for the rest of us, and for them as well. And that's the political challenge that we're all dealing with right now. It's a really difficult problem, but I actually think it's one that we're going to slowly be able to solve because this is a problem that affects everyone. And eventually, the effects are going to become so obvious that people will get scared and, and do something about it. My only worry is that by the time people wake up and try to do something about it, let's hope it's not too late to save some of the big ice sheets. Well, let's stop there and actually just open it up now for questions and see what you want to know about the climate system or about the energy system or any of this. Can we turn the lights up a little? You mentioned biomass. It sounds like it's a trade-off as far as it doesn't solve and it doesn't improve. Yeah, so, you know, I actually want to have the students ask questions, but, but, um, but that's fine. Yeah, the question was, um, what about biomass? It seems like it's kind of a trade-off. Biomass. The answer is it depends on the sort of biomass. Um, one of the problems is a very large fraction of our energy, our fossil fuel energy, come, is really oil. And we use oil mostly for transportation. It's about 40% of the CO2 we put in the air is from oil today. And so going forward, if you want to reduce CO2 emissions, you have to come out with an alternative. And the problem is an alternative to the internal combustion engine that we use in our cars or the gen engine we use in our airplanes is really difficult. Those are old technologies, and they're really good technologies, and it's hard to find an alternative. So one idea is biofuels, where you actually take biomass and convert it to either ethanol or some other chemical that we can burn in our engines. The problem with that is you have to be very careful about the energy accounting. For example, when you take corn and make it into ethanol, it requires you know, about 80% of the energy you get out of the ethanol, it requires that much energy to grow the corn in the fertilizer and the tractors and the transportation. So by the time you're done, you haven't really gained very much. Okay? There are maybe other ways of doing it, though, that are going to be more efficient. The problem with biomass is that if we start cutting down forests all over the world to grow crops for fuel, it's going to run into other problems. And then some people care about those forests and protecting some natural habitats for certain organisms. So there's actually a bit of a conflict between biofuels and biodiversity, which you would want to protect some places in the world. For example, they're cutting down the rainforest in the Amazon right now to grow soybean. And some of that soybean is made into biodiesel. That's a problem. And so the question is, how is that going to be resolved? We're going to find out over the next few decades. Any other questions? Yes. Absolutely. I'd love to get the students, please. Yes. I've never actually heard of Australia as being like a you know, such a problem. I mean, do they? They don't have nearly as many people as there are. That's right. So one of the reasons it's so red is that it's very sparsely populated. And if you go to Australia, certain parts of Australia, like in Queensland, frankly, it looks a lot like the US. They drive big cars, and they use a lot of energy. And it's, um, it looks a lot like the US, um, but it's very sparsely populated. So, so uh, we could draw another graph where it shows the total CO2 emissions, and that would target the US right now, and then China. We're responsible for about a quarter of the world emissions of CO2. China's a little bit less than that, but growing fast. And, uh, Europe is behind that. How about a student? Anyone? Yeah. 
So it's been suggested. The question is, what if we farmed the carbon? What if we grew lots of plants to try to take the carbon up out of the atmosphere? Is that the question? It turns out that, that it's been suggested. And in fact, some of it is actually being done. Not really intentionally, but it turns out that like all over New England, there's something going on called reforestation. A hundred years ago, when you walked through the part of the world that I live, there were all these stone walls around pastures. Today, those stone walls are deep in the woods. Those woods didn't exist 100 years ago. It was all farmland. So there's been a lot of regrowth of forests in the US. And that, that regrowth is actually taking up CO2 in the atmosphere. That's why only 60% of the fossil fuel CO2 we burn from coal, oil, and gas ends up in the atmosphere. 40% gets taken up part by the ocean and part by the land. Now, some people are saying, well, what if we could increase this? What if we could plant a lot more trees? And the answer is, you could. The estimates are that the best you could do would be about 10 to 15% of how much CO2 we put in the atmosphere. So it's a part of a solution, but it doesn't solve the whole problem. Yeah? How much does population change affect climate change? That's a very good question. So currently, we have about 6.5 billion on its way to 7 billion people in the world. Most demographers, people who study population, think that population is going to peak sometime in the middle of the century or towards the end of the century around 9 or 9.5 billion people and then slowly decrease from there. So population is going to go up a little less than 50%. Okay, So that's part of what's driving this increase in energy that we need for the world. But it turns out the much bigger driver is actually the fact that people are getting richer. So it's not just the people, the new people that are coming. It's the people who are here today, even if population were constant, places like China and India, they're getting richer. And therefore, they want televisions and air conditioners. And they want to drive cars. And that all produces more CO2 and uses more fossil fuel. So it turns out the much bigger factor than population growth is the fact that the economies of these countries are growing so fast, including our own. How about someone else? Yeah. What would you recommend people doing in their everyday lives? You know, there are a number of different things you could do in your everyday life. The one thing is learn as much as you can about this. Second thing is try and think in your everyday life how you can actually be a little bit more energy efficient. You don't have to suffer. We should all live comfortable lives. But on the other hand, you know, if your air conditioner is on and you're going out for the day, turn it off. Some people already do that. Turn lights off when you're not using rooms. All of those things matter. And if you can walk instead of drive, it's a good thing. Or if you can carpool and not drive by yourself, that's a good thing. And you can bug your parents to be careful about these things, too. That all works. And then, of course, the other thing that you're going to be able to do soon is vote. And say, you know what, to our political leaders, this issue matters. You know, unfortunately, in this country, this issue has become very politicized. And so generally, you have Al Gore, a liberal Democrat, and Bush, who doesn't believe in climate change. It's, it's, um, it's sad, because in fact, in most countries, this is not a political issue. If you look at Germany, for example, there's a conservative leader of Germany, and she's very, very serious about dealing with climate change. In England, when Tony Blair, who was a Labour Party, a liberal, was very, very strong about climate change, the Tory party, the conservatives, were also very concerned about climate change as well. So in most countries, this is not a partisan issue. Unfortunately, in this country, it's become a partisan issue, and I think that has to change. The good news is that it's starting to change, in that one of the leaders in the Senate on this issue is John McCain, who's a very conservative Republican, and hopefully that's going to change more and more. Yeah. Well, you know, my knowledge of climate change doesn't actually give me any great insight. Who supports your view then? I would say that um, that's a very good question to ask the candidates. And I would say most of the candidates do not yet have a clear climate and energy policy. In fact, I would say none of them I've heard 
have a very clearly articulated national energy policy, and we need one. There's big questions about what we do with oil, how we're going to deal with the future of oil. Turns out that oil around the world is, is diminishing in production, not absolutely, it's still growing, but many of the big oil fields that we rely on are actually slowly declining, and we have to discover new oil to make up for that. This is a big issue, and we have to think about that. Um, and right now, it's sort of a mishmash, our, our energy policy, and none of the candidates have a very good energy policy. I would say, hopefully over the next six months, as the primary season is upon us, we will see them come out, and this will become more of an issue, but I don't really know yet, so I'm actually holding back. Just right now. <laughs> oh, I don't know. I, you know, that's a, that's a personal question, and I don't think that... that, that. Based on climate change, I would say that I think um, uh, John Edwards has a very strong position. I think Barack Obama is, um, is trying to develop a position, but doesn't have a firm idea yet. And I think Hillary Clinton has a bunch of advisors from the Clinton era, and Bill Clinton himself is very committed to this issue and is working on this issue separately with the Clinton Global Initiative. Um, so she has a pretty clear plan. I don't think it's as aggressive as I would like to see. Um, on the Republican side, um, I think Giuliani, his campaign people have actually talked to me recently. They want to try to solve this problem. Um, they think this could become an interesting political problem for the Republicans, and they'd like to sort of separate themselves from some of the the current le Republican leadership that has downplayed this problem. Um, and uh, I think most of the other Republican candidates, except for John McCain, who has always been outspoken on this issue, um, has not, they, they really haven't articulated a clear position yet. But I'm not gonna tell you who I'm gonna vote for, that's, that's private. Yeah. In the back there. No, 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 I'm, I, I'm sorry, I can't tell you who I'm gonna vote for, it's not fair. That's why they have a closed ballot, yeah. <laughs> That's a good question. So the question is about the Chicago Carbon Credit Exchange. So the idea is, in Europe right now, there's a carbon trading system. What that means is, within the European Union, there's a system that places a price on carbon dioxide. And plants that emit carbon dioxide are issued credits, or issued permits, essentially, that allow them to emit a certain amount. And they can trade those permits. So if they actually find ways of reducing their emissions, they can actually trade the permits with other businesses that need to, re to produce extra CO2. And this uses, this is a system that economists like because it uses the market system, which tends to be very efficient in actually lowering prices. It hasn't worked so well so far in Europe because they haven't gotten it, the, 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 the sort of the levels right. But, but they're hoping that, that it will start working soon. Chicago Exchange is a weird one because it's actually a voluntary one. And so, it's sort of an experiment at anticipating regulation of carbon dioxide in this country before it actually happens. And so it's interesting, but I think it's pretty small right now. Um, I think a much more interesting case is the European one, where there's actually teeth behind it. Yeah. Um, why are like, um, energy companies expected more to use renewable energy? For renewable energy, it turns out that, that a lot of energy companies are doing a lot. So solar and wind in this country are growing at like 30% per year. You can't actually buy solar panels these days. It's so difficult, they're six months in, out in demand. They, the, the, the manufacturers can't keep up with them. And the same is true for wind turbines. GE makes a lot of wind turbines. You, you, you need to order one a year in advance. It's because, it's because they haven't been able to keep up the production yet to meet the demand. Germany is doing a huge experiment. Germany is actually subsidizing solar at a huge rate. They're paying people 60 cents a kilowatt hour, which is a huge amount of money. It's about double what it costs to put in solar, to put in solar power. And Germany is pretty high latitude. It's not the sunniest place in the world. New Mexico would be a much better place for solar. Germany's paying a lot of money for people to put it in with the hopes that as the sales increase, the price will come down. Hasn't happened yet, but we're watching it very carefully. So actually, energy companies are putting money in. It turns out, though, that in some parts of the world, like in China, 
they're blackouts. The people need electricity so much that they need every bit of energy they can get. And so for electricity, for example, they need coal, they need wind, they need solar. Anything you give them, they say, great, we need that too. Because their economy is growing so fast that they need every kind of energy they can get. Yeah. Uh, so who should we invest in? <laughs> Very interesting question. Uh, you know, that's why I'm a scientist and not an, an, uh, uh, a venture capitalist. Although a lot of venture capitalists are asking me that same question. Um, energy is really complicated. And the reason is that it's kind of not like internet, where you have a new idea and then bam, you can make a big company and it grows really fast. It's a lot more about scale. There's a, there's a price. And if you can beat that market price, say for oil, with some new technology, it's great. But the real question is, how big can you get? How much can you scale it? And that's really the challenge. And if you look at really large scale solutions for energy, there's still only a few real options. And so um, I suspect that the biggest companies in the world are probably going to be the ones to make the most money off these changes. The largest company in the world publicly traded is ExxonMobil. And you know what? They're going to, whatever happens, they're going to make a lot of money. They're going to make money putting CO2 back in the ground if that's what people decide to do. Because they really know about taking gas out and putting gas into the ground. They're really good at it. Another, the second biggest company in the world is GE. And GE already has clean coal plants. And they'll sell you a dirty coal plant, but they'll also sell you a clean coal plant that's, that captures the CO2 and you can stick it underground. So they're, they're going to make money either way. So I suspect it's the big companies that are going to end up dominating as well. Yeah? How much did the industrial revolution change the CO2 in the air? So remember that, that earlier graph? Mm -hmm. That whole rise in the last 200 years is basically because of the industrial revolution. A small part, about 20% of the rise in CO2 is because of deforestation. But the rest of it is because of fossil fuel due to the industrial revolution. And most of that in the last 150 years. Other students. Yeah. Um, so I know the Amazon is like really large part of our oxygen. Um, if we were to like start reforesting it right now, like how long would it take to get all that back? So it turns out that the, the question is about the oxygen or about the about the Amazon? About the Amazon. So the Amazon is being cut down for sure. And it's being cut down for a variety of uses. It's not just soybeans, it's also cattle, and it's also other land uses and expansion of population in Brazil and other parts of the Amazon as well. Um, the um, reforestation in the Amazon is a very difficult thing. It's hard to regrow the Amazon. It does regrow in certain places, but it's difficult because once you lose, if you, if you clear cut the Amazon and you lose the trees, the soil is pretty thin and it actually quickly um, you lose the nutrients and you end up with a very dry, thick um, uh, iron oxide layer that's very resistant to regrowth. And so that's a big problem. You know, I have a friend who was just down in the Amazon and he has these beautiful uh, movies he took flying in a small airplane over some of these soybean fields. What they do by law is they're supposed to protect certain areas of the forest, so they clear cut huge areas and plant soybeans and dump fertilizer and grow these amazing soybeans. Um, and then they protect little patches of the forest. And he took pictures of the rainforest and the rain. And it turns out that you see these rain clouds, and they're right over the forest, not over the soybeans. <laughs> and it's very interesting, because part of the rainforest, most something like 70 or 80% of the water that falls is actually recycled from evaporation from the trees themselves. So the rainforest is kind of a self-sustaining thing where there is some water that comes in from the Atlantic, but most of it is actually recycled. Water evaporates from the leaves of the trees and then rains again. And so when you cut down the trees, the rainfall stops because this whole cycle is broken. And that's why it's also difficult to regrow the Amazon. How long would it take depends on how fast you do it and what you do to, to make it happen, but it's a big problem. But, but it's, it's probably not related directly to the climate. It's more related to other human activities. Yeah? Um, uh, you were showing 
Uh, Adam, uh, is it replacing anything, or is it just, is that, is the atmosphere expanding? The atmosphere is, the way you can think about it is, um, the atmosphere is expanding a very, very little bit. Remember, the CO2 is only changing by, you know, over the Industrial Revolution, 100 parts per million so far, which isn't that much, compared to the atmosphere, which is one atmosphere, which is like a million parts per million, OK? So, so basically, it's a, it's a relatively small change. But the other pro point is that most of the mass of that change is actually from the oxygen. So as CO2 goes up, oxygen goes down. And the good news is that oxygen in the atmosphere is about 20%. CO2 is really low. So a change of 100 ppm doesn't change oxygen very much. It just changes oxygen a very little bit. So it's not going to harm anyone. But you can actually measure the change. So most of the change in mass is actually just because you're taking fossil fuel, coal, and oil from the ground and putting it in the air. That's CO2. It's just the carbon, though. The oxygen is from the air itself. I'm sorry. Who, I, missed, I must have missed the hand. Who is it? Yeah. Are there a lot of people like, invested in researching the recycling of carbon in the air? Like you were talking about that company was putting it back into the ground. And if, if so, or if not, you know, why, why not? Why so, so there are a lot of companies interested in this. Um, some of them um, are big utility companies. Some of them have a variety of other means. Um, there's a guy here right now who has a company trying to do this sort of thing. Um, thus far, it depends really on who is willing to pay that price to take care of that carbon. It turns out, though, that we've actually been putting carbon dioxide underground for a long time for a completely different reason. The oil companies have been doing it for about 30 years, something called enhanced oil recovery. It turns out that oil wells, you know, you ever heard of a gusher? But that is, you know, you sink a well in and psh, the oil is overpressured and literally shoots out the pipe. That's a young oil well. After a while, the pressure drops and you have to start pumping it. And you keep pumping and you pump and you pump. And after a while, you're getting mostly water and not much oil. And so after a few decades, they shut the oil well down. Well, it turns out that what they've learned is that by pumping CO2 into the ground, CO2 is very effective at pushing the oil out. And so what they do is they put CO2 in one well and pump at the other well, they actually get a lot of oil out. So they can take old oil wells that are no longer producing oil and get more oil out of them by pumping CO2 in. So they've been doing this, and so we actually have a lot of experience putting CO2 underground, and we know how to do it. But doing it at the scale to actually affect this problem is like a thousand times bigger than that. And so we have to scale it up, and that's really the challenge. Yeah? Would there be a way to, I don't know, somehow send it into space? Well, the problem there, sending it into space, is that the energy required to put it up into orbit is more than the energy you got from originally burning the coal and oil. So that wouldn't be very efficient. That's actually one of the limitations. My graduate student and I recently wrote a paper called The Thermodynamics of Carbon Sequestration. And what it is, it's about the energy balance. And the constraint is you can never use more energy than you got by burning the fossil fuel in the first place. So you know, if you get a certain amount of energy in a coal plant by burning coal and making electricity, you can only use some fraction of that energy to put the CO2 back underground. If you use more energy than that, it's not worth it. Right? So that's the real constraint. Who hasn't asked a question yet? Who's a student? The adults can come up afterwards. Anyone who hasn't asked a question yet? OK, well, you get to ask the second one. Well, so, so that's what the idea of biofuels is, or what biological sequestration is, is planting plants to suck up the carbon. The problem is that doing that in a way that really adds substantially to our problem is difficult. So the, we think the most we could do is about, as I told you, about 10 or 15% of what we add to the atmosphere every year from burning fossil fuel. So, you know, that's some people are working on, the idea of artificial um, photosynthesis. Here's the problem. 
This is an example where evolution has worked on this problem for a really long time. You know, there are people in the biofuels area that are talking about genetically engineering plants to grow faster. And I gotta say, I watch this and I kind of think it's a joke. They don't, there are a lot of venture capitalists putting money into these companies, genetic startup companies for biofuels. And it's really silly and I'll tell you why. Genetic revolution in the agricultural area has done amazing things. Have you seen, have you ever been in Washington State and looked at the wheat? When I went and visited a friend in Pullman, Washington, it was wheat harvest season, and I ran through this field of wheat, and I was expecting, you know, fields of wheat this high. The field of wheat was like down around my shins. Wheat plants are this tall, and the, the wheat kernel is this big. They've genetically engineered the plant to have less, put less energy into the stalk and more energy into the wheat kernel that we actually use. So most of the genetic engineering that's gone in to optimizing crops, whether it's corn or wheat or whatever, is ones that change the way the plants partition energy, putting more energy into the fruit we like and less into the stalks that we don't like and the waste material, right? But it turns out that, that absolute growth of plants is something that nature has been trying to optimize for a really long time. Land plants have been around for 400 million years. And you know that plants that grow really fast, we call them weeds. <coughs> there have been 400 million years of experiments. And plants have been trying to perfect this for 400 million years. The idea that we're going to come in and figure out a better way to do it is actually probably naive. Um, in fact, that's, that, and so far that's been proven the case. Yeah, we, we should probably take just one or two more questions. Is that right? Yeah, Um, they've done both. Sometimes they've actually just selectively bred them. And sometimes, and that's actually the way most of our crops actually evolved naturally. You know, originally the predecessor of corn was this tiny little thing that tasted horrible. And over centuries of selective breeding, we developed modern maize, or even primitive maize, which is still not as good as modern maize. So, so most of the crops we have have come from selective breeding. And then on top of that, we've genetically engineered them beyond that. So for example, there are species that we build in pesticides that are, make them resistant to certain types of pests. And we can actually put that into the genes. Um, there's a lot of fight over this. The Europeans think that this is scary and bad for your health. The American agricultural business thinks that this is good because we can grow more crops on the same land and use less water and less, less pesticide. And that argument is an interesting one. I don't actually have a position on that, but it's a, it's a very interesting discussion. Okay, one last question, then we'll stop. Yeah, so that was about, actually it's about 1940 to 1970 um, when global temperatures did drop, not very much, but they kind of went up and then they sort of stabilized and went down a little bit and then sort of since the mid-70s they've really shot up. Um, there are really two theories. One has to do with natural variability, that the natural cycle has been going like this and that superimposed on that is the anthropogenic effect which in the 40s through the 70s was not enough to overwhelm that signal. By the way, that's mostly a northern hemisphere signal. It's not as much of a global signal. Um, the second explanation, which I think is more accurate, is the one involving aerosols, and this is another complication. Sulfate aerosols are produced when we burn coal, mostly, and sulfur dioxide goes into the air and then gets oxidized to sulfate, and these particles, these aerosols, are in the air and they actually reflect light back to space. And so they cool the climate. So they actually counterbalance CO2. It's the idea that most climate scientists, I think, accept is that, is that during the 40s and 70s, I think probably some of it was natural variability, but, but a lot of this was actually sulfate aerosols, where, where the sulfate aerosol concentration went up and actually overwhelmed the CO2. Now, why did then things shoot up in the 70s? And the answer is that sulfate aerosols don't stay in the atmosphere. They drop out in a year or two, or sometimes even shorter than that in just a month or two. So, you know, when Mount Pinatubo 
the big volcano went off. The big effect was a cooling of temperature globally, and that was because of sulfate aerosols that went into the atmosphere. Okay? So coal plants are kind of like that, but at a very small scale. Now, the difference is, though, that CO2 stays in the air for a couple hundred years, and the sulfate aerosols drop out. So eventually, CO2 concentrations build and build and build, and then the sulfate aerosols can't no longer compete, and that's when you see temperatures going up. So when you superimpose those two effects, you actually are able to re recreate the, the rise in temperature from about 1850 to about 1940, and then, and then the cooling from 1940 to 1970, very slight, and then really rapid warming in 1970 as the CO2 concentration rises and kind of overwhelms the sulfate aerosol signal. Um, but I'll tell you, it leads to one interesting thing, and I just want to plant this in your head. Remember I said, is there a way to stop Greenland from melting? Imagine if you're now the president of the United States, or frankly, pick a country, the president of any large country in the world, and suddenly the captain of your armed forces calls you, the, the, your top general calls you and says, we've just had a satellite picture. We were wrong. Climate change is worse than we thought, and a big chunk of Greenland has broken off and slid into the sea, or West Antarctica, and we now think it's going to disappear in a decade. Sea level is going to go up seven meters, our whole country or a big part of our country is going to be flooded. For the U.S., that means pretty much every coastal city in the U.S. What are you going to do? And you're the president of the United States or the leader of any of one of these countries. What do you do? Well, if I were that president, the first thing I'd do is say to my general and to everybody else in my government, is there any way to slow it down? Is there any way to stop it? And the answer is yes. There is, it's actually through adding more aerosols, perhaps sulfate, but perhaps other particles engineered to reflect sunlight back to space. So we can actually try to actually engineer the climate by compensating for the CO2 by putting up stuff that reflects light back to space. Now, I'll tell you, many scientists think this is a very scary thing because when you start to engineer the climate, now you become dependent on it. And if we screw that up, we really, really are in trouble. So there's a big debate about whether this sort of technology should be used. I think we need to talk about it seriously because I think it can't just be one country's decision. I think we actually have to, as a whole world, come together and decide if we're going to do this, how? And are we going to make sure we're responsible? You don't want to have dueling nations. You don't want to have China saying, well, it's a little hot today. Let's send up some more aerosols. And the US saying, look, we're having a cold winter. Let's uh, take a few aerosols out of the atmosphere. You know, that would be a mess. So let's, so, but these are issues that are going to be coming, maybe not in the next few years, but probably in the next few decades. So we're actually having a big conference at Harvard to discuss those issues very soon. So let's stop there. Thanks very much for coming. And any adults who are here who didn't get to ask questions, I'd be happy to talk to them afterwards. Thanks. difficult to make a vaccine for HIV. So I hope to see you.